thanks again for involving me. It's, it's an honor to be speaking to all of you folks today. So for my 40 minutes, I'm going to be talking about TMJ or, or TMD issues. So I uh, titled my discussion, The Five W's of TMJ. Uh, Dr. Hernandez already touched on this, but um, yeah, I work predominantly at the university. I also maintain a private practice here in Edmonton uh, part-time. So just a few acknowledgements, a couple of the textbooks I drew upon for my lecture material, contemporary oral medicine and uh, management of temporomandibular disorders and occlusion by Dr. Okeson. So this is the contents for, for my lecture today. I want to start by just explain what is TMJ TMD, you probably hear both of these terms get thrown around. And there's a lot of confusion both uh, in the general public, but even within the medical and dental communities. So we'll kind of lay down the ground groundwork for that. I want to talk about who suffers from TMJ or who's more likely to uh, develop these types of issues. I want to talk about, okay, where do we actually feel the pain? What would be considered actually jaw TMJ pain versus something else that um, some of my other lectures will talk about later on today. What are some of the main symptoms we might present with? Uh, when do we see it? Why do people get TMJ? I'll try to answer that as best as I can. It's not uh, necessarily an easy question. Uh, but first, we're going to start with what is TMJ? So I think we've all heard it, but TMJ is it's, it's an acronym. So it stands for Tempero. That refers to our temporal, temporal bone, right? Up where our temples are. Mandibular, referencing our mandible, which is our lower jaw. There's just one mandible. Joint. So TMJ, I always kind of jokingly tell patients this, but everybody has TMJ, right? We all have two joints, right? One on either side. Now, when we talk about actual problems, be it pain or clicking or inability to chew, we're actually talking more about what we call TMD. So TMD stands for temporomandibular joint disorder. The, the technical term is disorder. You'll sometimes hear people reference dysfunction, but uh, you know, in the textbooks, we'd go with disorder, but we know what you mean when you say TMD. Now, it's important to note that TMD is actually what we call an umbrella term, okay? It's not a specific diagnosis. So even though you'll often get patients or you'll hear other people say, yeah, I have TMD, it's almost like saying I have a knee problem or I have a stomach ache. There's a lot of subcategories and clarification that needs to be uh, done to get a specific diagnosis because the specific diagnosis is what's going to dictate treatment uh, outcomes and prognosis. So um, although we, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge area, we always, always want to get a specific diagnosis. So if, if you see anybody and they just diagnose you with TMD, you might want to ask, okay, what specifically, what part is it? The muscle, is it the joint, uh, and so on. So who, who tends to get TMD issues? Well, a few things. Number one, it's a, it's a fairly common thing we see in the population. Now, approximately four to five percent of the uh, of the population will get painful TMD symptoms. Now, this is a bit of a mis misnomer because quite a few higher percentage of the population will have some degree of a click or some type of minor dysfunction. But if people that have you know true pain, we're looking at around four four to five percent. Certainly, some studies will have it quite a bit higher than that. The most common presentation of TMD is muscle pain. So not even the joint itself, we're not even talking about the TMJ, it's the muscles involved with moving the jaw that tend to be the biggest players in causing pain. The technical uh, medical term for that will usually be myalgia. So you might hear the term masticatory myalgia referencing your muscles of mastication, which I'll, I'll get into a little more detail later. Um, we see this in everybody, but it certainly is more common in women, about four times more likely than men to develop TMD, which tends to be the norm with a variety of different painful, uh, you know, chronic pain conditions. So it's certainly in line with other things we see. Uh, the general age range, although again, this is not, uh, doesn't capture everybody, but it tends to be more common post-puberty, pre-menopausal. That is the main demographic. 
Now, the National Academy of Medicine a few years ago uh, did a large scale study looking at TMDs and evidence based treatment and diagnosis. And as part of their research, they wanted to look at what types of conditions are found associated with or comorbid with TMD. So it's not to say one of these causes the other, but, but in a lot of patients, particularly for chronic TMD, so pain that's been going on you know, at least three months, but in many cases, years and years, patients will have other types of dysfunction that are occurring with it as well. Now, I'm not going to read through this entire list. It's you know quite lengthy, as you can see, but there's a, long, a large variety of uh, rheumatology conditions, GI issues, neurology, so nervous system impairment, uh, allergies, autoimmune things. So there's a lot of different conditions we might see comorbid. And that just kind of talks to maybe some of the underpinning causes of TMD being a little bit unknown because there seems to be a, a bit of a, an aspect of dysfunction maybe in your nervous system, your endocrine system, your immune system, um, you know, psychological factors are significant, have a significant role in this as well. Uh, so what are some of the predictors for TMD? So people that have various GI issues, but in particular IBS, uh, lower body pelvic pain, uh, different types of headaches, uh, be it tension type or migraine headaches, patient awareness of what we call parafunction, so clenching or grinding or bracing of the jaw, be it at night or during the day. Uh, a variety of different other somatic si uh, symptoms. So generally feeling unwell, tired, dizzy, that type of thing. Uh, deteriorating and worsening sleep quality. So less, less sleep and the sleep you do get is of poor quality. So these will all kind of predict for possible future likelihood of developing jaw symptoms. And that is why, and you'll probably hear me and others talk about this multiple times during this uh, session today, is multidisciplinary care is crucial. This is not just within the confines of medicine or dentistry or physiotherapy or psychology or, you know, the, there's more beyond that. But it's a, it's a group effort in many of these chronic cases to best manage symptoms. All right. So where do we actually feel jaw pain? So... As I mentioned uh, a second ago, muscles are the most common uh, source of the pain. And the two most important muscles you guys should probably be aware of are what we call the masseter muscle. So we're looking at the masseter here. This is the big muscle just on the side of our cheek here. Okay, It goes from the hard bone, or we call our zygoma. So there's a hard bone you can kind of feel in your face down to your mandible. So between those two bones is where the masseter lies. And one way to localize it or feel it, just put your hands over the side of your face and just clench together, right? And you're going to feel a little bulge, okay? That's your masseter. So that's a jaw closing muscle. So anytime we're chewing, we use it a lot to talk. Uh, people that might clench or grind their teeth, this muscle is constantly being activated. So as you can imagine, if this muscle is getting overused, so if you have a particular diet or eating a lot of hard or chewy foods or we're constantly chewing gum, this is where we tend to get those achy and sore muscles. Now, another thing that makes this somewhat more complicated is that you can have what's termed pain referral, where essentially you might have pain in one source, in this case, the masseter, so the jaw, but it refers pain elsewhere. So you actually feel the pain in another area. So Dr. Hernandez will talk a little bit about this later, about kind of atypical toothaches, where the tooth is healthy, but yet you still, still feel pain. So this is one example, but even earaches, I get patients on a frequent basis that come in like, yeah, my jaw hurts, but I also get all of these earaches. I've been to my family doctor a few times. They've taken a look. I've been treated with antibiotics and nothing seems to be helping. Certainly a consideration in those cases is maybe the jaw has a, a, a bit of a factor in some of these ongoing earaches. The other muscle you guys should be aware of is what we call the temporalis. So the temporalis is a big fan-shaped muscle on the side of our head. And it also has the same function as the masseter. It helps to close the jaw. So again, anytime we're eating, talking, clenching, or grinding, this mus muscle is going to be firing. So one way to just localize it um, is just bring your hands up to your temples and just clench and relax a few times. Right? Clench and relax. And what you're going to do is you're going to feel that little bulge there, okay? So that's your temporalis. 
And so I'm sure many of you, of course, being uh, you know involved in this presentation, likely suffer from various types of TMD. So it'll probably resonate that this is a common area we get a lot of headaches. There's different types of headaches we get. Of course, the, the main two would be intention headaches, migraine headaches. Um, there's also a classification of headaches that are directly related to TMD. It's called a headache attributed to TMD. And these are those headaches you get maybe at the end of a long meal, for example, right? Or you have a big chewy steak. It takes a lot of jaw work to get through it. And by the end, you just have a throbbing headache. So certainly uh, not all headaches in this area can be attributed to the jaw. There's a lot of different causes, certainly, but this would be one thing to consider, and uh, particularly if it's related to jaw use. Again, the temporalis also has different referral patterns, so it doesn't necessarily just hurt right in the temple. Sometimes we get pain that might spread across our forehead or, or across our eyebrows, or again, we might get atypical pain in our teeth or sinus seeming pain, right? You might feel like you have a sinus issue. You go to your medical doctor to have it checked out. Your sinuses are all clear. This would be another thing that you might wanna consider um, as, as a potential cause. So beyond the muscles um, is the actual joint itself. Okay, so I'll kind of walk you, sorry, walk you through this. The temporal bone we have up top here, so that this where you see this thing labeled MF, that stands for the mandibular fossa. It's basically the little cave where the lower bone fits into. That's part of the temporal bone. This little kind of hole, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not. I apologize if you can't, but just behind the joint, you can kind of see a little hole in the top left picture and in the bottom right picture here. That's your external auditory or acoustic meatus. So that's kind of right where your ear is or the inner workings of your ear. So just to localize it, you can see how close your ear is to the joint. Now the mandible, uh, the part of the mandible that actually sits up in the temporal bone is what we call the condyle. Okay, so where you see LP and MP in this picture, that just stands for lateral pole and uh, medial pole, so the outside and the inner aspect. But this is the part of the this is the bony part of the jaw that actually hinges and moves forward. Okay, so when we move the jaw, and if you it was, uh, is a little test, you can just put your fingers right in front of your ears on both sides and just open and close a few times. Most of you will be able to actually feel something underneath your fingertips. And that's most likely the lateral pole of the condyle that you're actually feeling there. Okay, so this obviously you can also get pain in the joint itself. And just like other joints in the body, the TMJ is susceptible to things like arthritis. So, you know, you could have arthritic pain present in the jaw as well. Now, I don't have any good pictures of, uh, you know, uh, structural pictures of this, so just bear with me on these little kind of cartoon graphics, but there's also something called the articular disc. So this is made out of cartilage, and it's essentially this little buffer that goes between the upper bone, the temporal bone, and the lower bone, the condyle. So there's that little space between those two bones. That's where this disc sits. Now this disc helps to lubricate the joint, make sure it's moving fluidly. It also acts as a bit of a shock absorber and makes sure everything is working. It also has some kind of protective capabilities to make sure you know, you're less prone to developing arthritis and things like that. But the important thing about this disc for most of you as patients is that it's implicated in joint noises and also locking of the jaw. So a lot of patients with TMD issues will de develop some type of click or a pop. Now, certainly not all of them are directly related to the disc, but the vast majority are. And we can see in this little graphic on the right side, that blue thing is the disc. So in a normal joint where the disc is where it should be, when you open and close, everything moves kind of smoothly, okay? In what we call an anterior displacement, the disc is shifted anterior, which is forward. So it kind of goes this way, okay? Kind of down like that. When you have a disc displacement, every time you open, that disc pops back. It, what we call, reduces to normal. And when it reduces, it kind of rubs. It creates friction. And as you know, if we get enough friction, we actually get a, a noise. So that's actually the click you're hearing. Now, some people, unfortunately, go on to develop jaw locking, in particular, closed lock, the type of lock where you can't open. This is very different than an open lock when your jaw is stuck wide open. So... But for a closed lock, you can only open maybe a third or a half of normal, and it usually hurts. 
And most commonly what causes that is this disc is getting stuck. It's, it's, it's you try to open it and it kind of folds up on itself and it limits you. So for any of you out there that deals with the clicking or popping jaw or the locking jaw, it's this cartilage that's probably creating the issue. Now, I also want to really reinforce though that having an asymptomatic or an otherwise pain-free click is not cause for huge concern. You know, depending on the study you look at and the research, it's actually fairly common. You know, upwards of maybe one in three people have some degree of a click in the jaw. So if it's not painful, it's not getting locked, it's not impairing your function, it's probably not much to get too worried about. Now, certainly it can be a, a big nuisance. And, you know, if your family members are complaining across the table about your jaw popping, there are some treatments we can we can suggest, but um, just that very mild one, no one doesn't bother anybody. It shouldn't become a big issue for you. Not nothing worth uh, worrying too much about. So when and why? So as I previously mentioned, most common in post-puberty uh, in women, but I want to note that it can affect anyone. Um, you know, all, all genders, all ages can be affected by this. Absolutely. Um, it doesn't, uh, discriminate. Now, some of the factors that will impact the development of chronic TMD are fairly well delineated. Now, I talk about chronic TMD because this is jaw issues that persist past three months. Acute, kind of short-lasting jaw issues that they might flare up for a week and then they settle down, those are certainly less of a concern because, you know, by their nature, they're gone, right? But chron uh, chronic TMD is quite, quite common. And some of the uh, implicated factors are physical trauma of different types. So broadly, this could be micro trauma or macro trauma. So my, what I mean by micro trauma is kind of low grade wear and tear. Now, certainly everybody has that to some degree. The jaw is one of the most used joints in the body, right? Talking and eating all the time, but maybe people that are more prone to chewing gum all the time or their favorite snack or, you know, gummy bears, and they're constantly giving their jaw more of a workout or people that might clench or grind their teeth during the day or nighttime. That increases the risk. Now, macro trauma is a, sorry, this should say macro trauma. I do apologize. Ma micro trauma versus macro trauma. Macro trauma would include kind of big blows or knocks to the jaw. So this might be at a sporting event when you're younger, you got a basketball in the chin when you weren't looking or something like that. Car accidents are another very common cause. And it doesn't even have to necessarily involve direct trauma to the jaw. For example, a bad rear end accident where you might whip forward and hit the back of your head, that whiplash associated injury you get will often, not always, but often lead to some type of jaw dysfunction as well. So if any of you are you know, whiplash uh, patients, you probably very well know what I'm talking about. You get the neck pain, shoulders are tight, goes up jaw, you're getting headaches. These things all go together. And another thing is psychological trauma. It's really impossible to talk about chronic TMD without touching significantly on psychological factors. Um, I'll talk a little bit about it, but stress and things like that will often manifest and carry that tension in and around our jaw. And for a variety of factors, elevated levels of stress are implicated in all types of chronic pain. Um, now, the more we've kind of looked into research in, into chronic TMD patients, there's alterations, not just in pain processing, but as I had mentioned, immune function, inflammation levels, psychological function. So this is why this is well beyond just a dental concern, right? It's not just how your teeth fit together. There's so many more factors that need to be considered and addressed for successful outcomes. So there was a really well done study in the um, 2000s, um, and they're still producing papers based on the, the research done, but it was by a big group, multi-center group out of the United States. It was called the OPERA study. I won't uh, get uh, bogged down too much in the details, but they have a really nice graphic they developed looking at risk assessment for, okay, who's going to develop these chronic persistent TMD symptoms? So there's a lot going on in this image. But I think the takeaways is the two biggest factors, and they obviously subcategorize them here, but the two biggest factors to develop persistent and chronic TMD is high psychological distress, right? So mood disorders, anxiety, and dis uh, depression play into that are stress response. Then also a high state of pain amplification. 
So this involves our, our autonomic sy uh, system. So, you know, the fight or flight system where we get the cortisol and our heart starts going fast. A lot of people in this day and age will have kind of an overactive sympathetic nervous system. We're always ready to go, always kind of agitated. And that increases your likelihood of developing persistent uh, TMD. Also impaired pain regulation, pro-inflammatory state, which certainly circles back to you know dietary considerations and stuff like that. Well beyond my scope and the scope of uh, my presentation, but there's a lot of factors at play is my, my takeaway. Now, of course, all of these things or most of these things are underpinned by genetics, right? So there's certain genes that are going to make more certain people more prone to developing this. Now, by no means is it a genetic condition such that, you know, if one parent has it, it's a guarantee that it could be passed on to the offspring. It doesn't work like that, but it's just levels of increased likelihood. Now, on top of that, there's also environmental contributions so demographics, culture and health beliefs, social environment, so life stressors, right? Everybody has their own stresses. And for some people, it just, you know, the amount of stress given their, uh, you know, genetic makeup, it's just too much and their body can't compensate and they develop chronic issues and physical environment. So a lot of things at play is, is the important takeaway from this slide. Um, I want to touch a little bit on the role of anxiety, stress, and personality traits, because certainly there's a, there is some overlap, but it's quite difficult to tell. So historically, stress and anxiety have been correlated with what we call bruxism. So bruxism is like the clenching and grinding of your teeth. But that exact correlation, how it relates or association has been very difficult to quantify. Now, the thought is if we're stressed out, anxious, depressed a lot during the day, a lot of these hormones and different chemicals that are kind of, you know, moving their way through our system, affecting our nervous system, our immune system, they're going to have some carryover effects at night. So if we're stressed out all day, that might manifest by increased clenching at night is the thought. Uh, people that clench and grind a lot are found to have higher levels of cortisol. So one of the stress hormones and adrenaline and noradrenaline. So it's likely there is a correlation. So you know, whenever, when I ever talk to patients, I always talk about how are they coping and managing with stress levels, right? And I'm not a psychologist. I, I can only go so deep into this, but it's important that patients are aware of this. Most are, right? Most will tell you, yeah, when I'm stressed out at work or something goes on at home, I definitely, my jaw's more sore, my headaches increase, that type of thing. So most people are already intuitively aware, but it's always worth noting. Now, <laughs> to make this even a little bit more complicated though, is that they've actually run studies on people that clench and grind their teeth. And what effect does that have on morning headaches, for example? And it seems that actually the people with the most headaches didn't even clench the most. So there are a lot of people out there that might clench and grind their teeth a lot. Maybe you know somebody or you have a partner, they've ground their teeth down, they have little stubs, they're getting crowns and to fix them or they're breaking teeth, yet they have no pain at all, not a, not a concern in the world when it comes to the jaw. So I think a takeaway is there is ongoing research in this area. There's a lot of different academies uh, internationally, certainly in the States and Canada, looking into these things. So it's confusing ongoing research. So sometimes we don't have, as healthcare professionals, great answers for you. We don't always know. I really like this um, quote. The only true wisdom is in knowing we know nothing, right? Sometimes the more you know, the more you realize, the less we know. Now, we can't talk about pain in general, but definitely jaw pain without at least touching on sleep. So um, people with chronic pain um, tend to have issues both getting asleep and once they fall asleep, it's hard to get to deeper levels and maintain that restorative sleep. So it, you have these frequent arousals, which kind of reduces the overall quality of sleep that you're getting. So pain can trigger poor sleep quality, which leads to poor restorative sleep, which then unfortunately also leads to more pain. So it's this bit of the cycle. So in acute pain, if it's not too bad and it's short-lived pain and you get on top of it and you're on it early, you, you see a linear model, right? So pain is going to precede the poor sleep, but as soon as you get the pain back or the sleep will return to normal as soon as the pain goes away, right? Now in chronic pain, we have a bit of a circular model. 
So bad sleep leads to more pain, which is further going to impair sleep. So it's this little cycle. So I have this uh, little graphic from a textbook I like to use. And it's looking at, of course, on the left side here, this is for acute situations. So if the sleep quality goes down when you're hurt, but you're able to treat the, the symptoms early and effectively, sleep will go back to normal. Now in patients in this kind of chronic loop, they're gonna have bad sleep, which is gonna to lead to pain and, and so on. So in those cases, it's important that patients are aware of different measures to help improve their own sleep quality, right? There's a lot of information on sleep hygiene, you know, going to bed at the same time, careful with what you're consuming. Um, you know, I'm not going to go into too much detail on that, but it's, you know, it's easy to access that type of thing, but you always want to address your sleep uh, if you have chronic pain. Now, I can't have a discussion on TMD without talking a little bit about obstructive sleep apnea. It's an extremely hot topic in the dental field in particular, and the association between the two. It's still somewhat in its infancy as far as this connection. There has been a lot of good research. But I would say if you're a patient develop, uh, developing jaw issues, you're having sleeping problems, you clench and grind your teeth, it might be worthwhile to get screened for sleep apnea. Uh, your physician can do this. Some dentists will help with this. But even if you go online, there's different tools, like there's something called the Stop Bang tool, the Epworth sleepiness scale. These are tools that will just indicate your, your risk of sleep apnea. They are not uh, meant to diagnose anything. You have to actually go and have a sleep study done to do that. But there's going to be some overlap between people having obstructive sleep apnea and TMD or obstructive sleep apnea mimicking TMD types of symptoms, such as morning headaches and so forth. So this is something that um, your healthcare team can help you with, but certain maybe just a little bit of introspection. You can think, you know, am I snoring lots? My partner have to kind of roll me over. Do I wake up struggling to breathe? Do I sleep a full, you know, seven to nine hours yet I just feel extremely fatigued and tired and I've constantly fallen asleep throughout the next day? Those are types of things you want to just be aware of as uh, possible risk factors for sleep apnea. All right, so how do we diagnose TMD? So first off, your, your, your clinician, be it again, your physician, your physio, your dentist in many cases, will perform some type of interview, ask you a whole bunch of questions, right? Where does it hurt? When does it hurt? What makes it better? What makes it worse? That type of thing. But as far as actually clinically what they're going to do, we're going to do a TMJ evaluation. So they'll have you seated in the chair and mostly it's going to be what we call palpation, touch. They're going to be feeling the muscles and the joints. So here we can see a dentist palpating the masseter on the left side here, right? They might have the patient clench and relax their teeth and apply some pressure. Now, very a little bit of minor discomfort, I guess, is not, not nothing to be too concerned about. But if someone's pushing on your masseter and you're feeling kind of moderate pain, you know, like four, five, six out of 10 type of pain, that's not normal, right? That's a cause for concern. Uh, palpation of the temporalis as well. Usually they'll also palpate other kind of accessory muscles, but these are the main ones. As I mentioned, right, this is your masseter on the left side, temporalis on the right side. Uh, sometimes we could try to mimic the pain. So if a patient presents to me and says, yeah, you know, doc, I'm getting quite a few earaches on this side. Sometimes I'll apply some pressure over their masseter, just leave my finger there for, you know, 10 seconds and see if I can reproduce that pain. And in many cases you can, they'll say, oh yeah, now my ear's starting to ache. And that's a pretty good uh, you know, telltale sign that, okay, we don't have to treat the ear. If we treat the jaw muscle, the masseter, the ear pain should hopefully, hopefully improve or resolve. Assuming the ear has been you know, otherwise ruled out as being the cause by the, the physician. Uh, TMJ evaluation. So the dentist is gonna feel over the joints themselves and have you open and close a few times. So they're gonna be feeling for any clicking or popping noises. That might indicate, of course, the disc displacement. They might also listen for some crunching or grating or grinding noises. Sometimes uh, I'll have patients say, it's, it sounds like there's sand stuck in my jaw. And you can kind of feel it. And that's something called, called crepitus. It's kind of bone on bone. And it's uh, what we call pathognomonic. So that's the, the fancy term. Basically, if you have that grinding, sandy noise in your joints, you have some type of arthritis in your joint. And it's worth having it checked out further. So the dentist will be feeling the, the joints and the muscles. We'll take some measurements, right? We have kind of standard measurements of what's considered normal. So how wide you can open, and that's measured by measuring from your the, the tip of your 
bottom central tooth to the top of your, um, your maxillary incisor, so between the teeth, we want to measure how wide you can open. Now, we want to measure how wide you can comfortably open, right? Does it hurt to do that last bit? And how wide you can maximally open, even if you have to push past the pain. And that's going to give us as clinicians a bit of insight if this is more of a muscle pain or a joint pain. Also, you know, the, the, if, if you guys are interested and you have a ruler at home, 40 millimeters, so four centimeters is kind of considered the baseline of, of good. Now, that said, if you're opening a little bit less than that, it's not necessarily a huge cause for concern. It might mean there's an issue going on, but it's it, that alone is not the, the main outcome is just getting you to open 40 millimeters. We'll also measure side to side movements because that will give insight into joint issues. Now, certainly, rarely, if ever, are we, you know, doing the ultimate, you know, extending your jaw as far as you can to the left and as far as you can to the right. That's not a normal movement we make. Ours are going to be much more smaller, but it is going to give us um, a little bit of insight as to the health of the joint. Like if you can't move your jaw to the left, there's probably something going on with your right joint and, and, and vice versa. Another thing uh, patients will often be aware of is their jaw doesn't open straight, right? The jaw might swing off to the side or might swing and then come back. So we call these deviations and deflections. So on the left side here, where you kind of see the jaw come down, it goes to the side, but then it comes back. We call that a deviation. Um, there's a lot of different causes for this, but the classic one is when you have a disc displacement. So your disc is out of place, your jaw will tend to deviate or move to that side when you open. So you might have a click on your left jaw and when you open your jaw swings to the left, but then it goes back to normal. Okay. Again, certainly not ideal, but assuming it's fairly mild and functionality is, is not uh, being impaired, it's not a huge cause for concern. Now a deflection is when your jaw swings off to the side, it goes down into the side, but it doesn't come back to the, to the midline, doesn't come back to normal. Now a deflection also is, 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 is uh, you know, it tends to be related to jaw locking as well. So patient will come in and say, you know, doc, I can't open very wide. My jaw is swinging off to the side. And that's indicative of something structural going on in the jaw more often than not. So what else do we want to do? Generally speaking, in, in a dental setting, at least, we're going to want to get some imaging of the jaw. We want to take a look, you know, deeper to see what's going on with the bones. Okay. So the most common uh, tool for this, and, and probably most of you who've been to a, a dental clinic have had one of these taken at some point, is what we call the panoramic x-ray. It's that big one that goes around your head. It gives a two-dimensional view, so it's kind of flat out, but you can see your entire jaw. So you see all your teeth. If you have wisdom teeth, you can see them there, but you can see your jaw joints. It's used as a bit of a screening tool. So it, it, it's hard to diagnose off of these, but it certainly can give us an, an indication if something's wrong or if generally the bones look pretty good. Now, if you have a lot of jaw dysfunction, we might move on to more involved imaging. So in dentistry, we use something called a CBCT. It stands for um, a cone beam CT. It's, it's, it's similar to a medical CT, except it only shows hard tissue. Um, there's slight, I mean, some differences, certainly in, in parameters and how they obtain it, but it's, it's usually fairly accessible. Um, a lot of dentists will have these in office or there's places you can refer and get one of these done in a very short order. And it gives very good definition of the bones. Okay. It's not going to show anything though about the muscles, right? So if you only have muscle pain, it might come back completely normal and, and that's okay. It just means your joints are healthy. That doesn't mean there's not an issue. It just means the bones are good. Your issue lies elsewhere. In some cases, and this would probably be more in kind of a specialty setting or if a patient is being worked up for surgery, but we might order an MRI of the jaw as well. And the MRI is going to give better sense of where that cartilage disc is. But just so you know, just because you have a click or the occasional like pop in your jaw, you're not going to get an MRI for all these people. Because as I said, but one in three people have that to some degree. This has to be indication oriented. So based on symptoms and what we see in the chair. So here, this is an example of a panoramic, right? You can see the jaw joints. You can see the sinuses, but the teeth, of course. Um, this is a cross section from a cone beam CT. This is a patient that has some arthritis. So we can see the condyle and the, the um, temporal bone. And finally, something like an MRI, the arrow, that white arrow is actually pointing at the disc. That, that black thing is a, a displaced disc. Okay. 
So you, you may not need any imaging, right? It might be just fairly straightforward muscular issue, but um, these are the options available to us. All right, treatment. So I got about five minutes. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go through this fairly quick. So treatment should most importantly be conservative, right? Shouldn't be surgery. They shouldn't be cutting your teeth down, nothing irreversible to start. So what do we wanna consider? Well, first we wanna come at it from an evidence-based perspective, right? So that's gonna be based on best current scientific evidence because there's some treatments out there that to be blunt, there's not much research for them. Now, if they're otherwise safe, they're not gonna cause harm and they're not, you know, and they are irreversible, there's probably not much harm. But if people are doing things that don't have much evidence, but you're gonna have to say, cut a bunch of teeth down for crowns, there's concern, right? Clinical expertise. So whoever you're seeing is going to have their own mindset and different um, skill set. And finally, most importantly, is you as the patient, what are your values and preferences and how do you want to approach things? So our main goals, and I'm going to go through here, pretty good pace, reduce pain, restore function of the jaw, decrease factors that are making it worse. In some cases, if we've lost some muscle strength, we want to improve that. Reduce psychological distress because, again, we can't uncouple psychological distress and, you know, jaw pain for the most part. Prevent drug abuse, right? If patients are taking really heavy-duty medications to cope with the pain, we need to be careful with that, right? I, I think that's been, uh, you know, played out in in uh, for a variety of different types of pain complaints and, you know, with Percocets and Oxycontin and all of, all of those horror stories. We want to avoid that. And finally, ideally, we want to prevent progression to a chronic uh, pain condition. So the earlier we get on things, the better the outcomes tend to be. So the main options include patient education and counseling, uh, pharmacologic, so medications, essentially, uh, biobehavioral modalities, I'll get into that, different physical treatment options, injections, and then from a dental setting, there's a lot of different appliances we'll make. So most important, patient education. So you have to take care of your jaw. If, if, you're, if you're doing the wrong things as the patient, it's going to be really hard for anybody else to help you. So you have to be careful with your diet. Not necessarily forever, but when you're in a flare-up, you have to be very careful. Uh, see what's exacerbating things. If you're a gum chewer, you got to cut that out. If you, you know, are talk on a phone all day and you're like this, you want to maybe get a new headset or something like that. Always manage stress as best as one can. I know that's tricky, right? I tell patients that, and sometimes I get a bit of an eye roll. So you know, I acknowledge it's not easy, but it's it has to be said, right? So softer food, mashed potatoes, cut out gum chewing, that type of thing. Medications, in um, just given our time constraints, I won't talk too much, but there's acute pain medication. So things that will help in the short term, if you're having a flare up, that type of thing, anti-inflammatories, you know, Tylenol, things you can get over the counter, maybe some muscle relaxants. But then if you have had pain for many years, you have a chronic pain condition, there's a lot of medications that can help with that. And a lot of those actually tend to be more of the class of antidepressants or anticonvulsants. So patients sometimes get a little bit anxious, like, why are you giving me an antidepressant? Well, some of these medications are now used in a different fashion, and it's due to overlap in some of the, neuro, uh, some of the chemicals and neurotransmitters involved. But uh, if you're prescribed, uh, if you certainly prescribe an antidepressant for chronic pain, it's not a weird thing. It's not that the doctor's saying you have anxiety. That's why you have pain. It's a, it's a fra fairly common practice. Biobehavioral. So this involves things such as uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, maybe seeing a psychologist to help with some biofeedback to help relax when you're stressed during the day or helping manage other things or things you do on your own, be it I don't know, some mindfulness, you know, you hear that term all the time, but, you know, certainly there's some evidence that can help calm down your nervous system and help you relax and have a, a, a knock on a positive effect on your jaw pain. Uh, physical modality. So physiotherapy is, is the jaw is like any other joint. So seeing a good physiotherapist can help a lot. And they have all different types of tools, be it manual therapy, probably that has the most evidence, you know, things like acupuncture, uh, dry needling, ultrasound. Like, there's a lot of different options out there, but certainly this is a good place to start. You know, massage therapists, some chiropractors, there's a lot of different options. And sometimes you have to find one that works for you, but absolutely things you can do on your own heat pack, self-massage, that type of thing. Uh, therapeutic injections. I just want to briefly talk about this. Botox, you'll probably hear about it lots. It has its place. So, or neuromodulators is, is kind of the 
the more generic name, but Botox is what I think we all know. Um, it can help for muscle pain. The issue is it's off label for jaw pain. Okay. So what does that mean? So generally you're not going to get any insurance coverage and it's quite expensive. Just the medication itself can be in the hundreds of dollars and you have to get it done every three months or so. So Botox has its place. Talk to your physician or your dentist who does it. Um, and before you go any further on that, so has its place, but I would certainly exhaust some of these other options first. Oral appliances, uh, if you have some type of guard, so you might hear um, night guard, bruxism appliance, splint, orthotic, they're just different terms for plastic in the mouth. I want uh, a takeaway to be from this that uh, there's different types. So some are meant just to protect your teeth. Some have a role to help more joint issues. Some are for muscle issues. They're not all made the same. They're made differently. They have different indications. So if your dentist recommends some type of appliance and you're in a lot of pain, you might want to ask, okay, why am I getting this? What is it used for? And not all dentists have the same expertise. You know, full bias, I do a lot of this, but you know, we spend a lot of years training and looking at different tools and the best way to make these appliances for patients. So just because maybe you had one over the counter or one at your dentist didn't quite do the trick, maybe it just has to uh, be tweaked a little bit. So different designs, um, you have to find one that kind of works for you and you have to work with your dentist for that. I, I highly, or I, I strongly suggest being careful with over-the-counter ones. They can certainly protect your teeth, but more often than not, they actually aggravate jaw pain. Finally, I just want to briefly touch about surgery. Surgery is only used in refractory cases. So if everything I just talked about wasn't helping and there's something structurally wrong in the joint, that's when we might coordinate with our oral surgery colleagues to consider surgery. Um, patients that have chronic muscle pain, but the joints are healthy, surgery is never going to be an answer for them, uh, e even, even if nothing else really helps, unfortunately. They'll have to look at other strategies, but you don't want to jump in and do surgery if it's not indicated, obviously. Last, last slide, some uh, dental treatment considerations. So if you have jaw pain, keep appointments short. Tell your dentist or hygienist that you're having jaw issues. You want frequent breaks. Do not perform elective treatment when you're in a flare-up, right? Elective, so obviously if you have a toothache, you need to be seen, you got to get in. But don't go in for routine cleaning or a filling that might be able to wait if you're in a huge flare-up. Use a bite block, but just be careful that the dentist doesn't cram you open too far. Because I have had patients say like, yeah, they dentist stuck that plastic thing. And ever since that, I've had jaw issues. You only want to open as wide as comfortable for you as the patient, right? And the dentist wants you to open wide because it makes their life easier, but you know they might have to accommodate and work with you. And finally, if you have to go anyways, preemptive analgesia. So what is that? If you're going to the dentist, you know you're going to be open for an hour or so. Maybe take whatever you routinely take for your headache, anti-inflammatory, a Tylenol, maybe an hour before, and that'll just allow things to be a little bit easier afterwards. All right. I think I've run a little bit out of time. So thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And I hope, I hope it was insightful. Um, I'll pass it back to Dr. Hernandez.